This is the, the fourth annual uh, Academy of Science Business Leadership Forum. We have three so far, all organized by my colleague, Dr. Uh, uh, Maborto, whose, whose voice you just heard. And it, it was an attempt to really, <clears throat> uh, by a previous a CEO of the Academy, to, 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 to make that link explicit between what science does and what business does, and to have the best scientific uh, wisdom engage with the best uh, thinking in business and business education. And that is why we have these three amazing uh, persons here today. Uh, first of all, Mr. Wandile Shishnevo, who is uh, Chief Economist, uh, Agricultural Business Chamber of South Africa. I, was, uh, I absolutely enjoy reading his work in the business day. He's a formidable thinker and is, at the moment, Senior Lecturer Extraordinary at the Department of Agricultural Economics at uh, my home university, which is Stellenbosch University. Um, the extraordinary, as Kata Asmal, the Minister of Education, once says, uh, it's extraordinary because they don't pay you. <laughs> I don't know what deal with we pay you. But he's also a visiting research fellow at the Bits School of Governance um, and, uh, and uh, started off uh, with the BSc, served on, uh, uh, is a member of Stat South Africa, actually, and uh, uh, also writes for Farmers Weekly and so on. So, formidable. Uh, intellect uh, and somebody that I'm delighted to, to, to introduce to you. Then Professor Nicola Viegi, <clears throat> uh, uh, with Italian roots and a, a Scottish PhD, as I discovered, is the South African Reserve Bank Professor of Monetary Economics and Head of the Department of Economics at Turkey's, the University of Pretoria. He's worked at many different universities and is an expert on everything from monetary institutions to um, uh, political economy of government debt uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, a true giant in his field has also done macro modeling for emerging countries, etc. cetera. Uh, welcome to Wandile, welcome to Nicola. And then finally, Professor Heinrich uh, Baumann, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Economics also at Turkey's and also has an extraordinary theoretical and practical sort of uh, base of work from which he, he is able to speak to us on everything from macroeconomic planning, sector impact analysis, energy and environmental policy and, and labor markets. He is also the research director of the modeling and policy impact analysis group at the Partnership of Economic Policy and serves on the executive council of the Economic Society of South Africa, PhD from Monash, also a formidable voice. Um, welcome to you, to Heinrich. So <clears throat> our three speakers will uh, go in the order you see their names on the program. I, I happily hand over to Wandile, who will also share some slides. Uh, 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 Wandile, a very warm welcome. Thank you, Prof, uh, for the very generous introduction. Um, and good morning to the fellow panelists, uh, Professor Nicola and uh, Prof uh, Borman. Um, it's, it's good to, to, to join you today for this conversation. Um, Prof, what I, I thought I would do when I looked at the program that we have today, we, we have Professor Nicola, who's an expert on all monetary issues, which I think he can look at these geopolitics uh, matters and really try to enhance our understanding about how they influence the, the monetary space. And I thought on the concluding part, uh, Professor Borman, is really uh, 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 a, a, a good touch on the macroeconomic space and it can tie this all up uh, together for us. So I thought my contribution can perhaps be looking on agriculture and maybe I could take the next 10 minutes or so uh, to make some observations. And from a practitioner's perspective, if I may say that, because some of the questions that we've been uh, receiving on our side as the Agriculture Business Chamber, it's around people worrying to say with this war happening, where is South Africa sitting in as far as the food supplies? And how are we thinking about the pricing effect and also down the line going into next year? Because there's a number of things that are, in, are affected, fertilizers, agrochemicals, as you rightly spell out um, in the briefing note uh, for this session. And the best way that I thought it, it is also important to tie up on is with the situation that is happening in KZN and to make one or two comments onto that. So my input is really rounded up in that way. 
Where I would start off with uh, uh, is, is making a point that South Africa has generally been in good place in as far as its agricultural performance the past two years. We've been assisted by a number of things, uh, but the expansion in area plantings are relatively affordable uh, inputs that farmers could acquire, uh, attractive crop prices that we were seeing, which enhanced their profitability. And the guys managed to plant and we were sitting fairly well and saw two years of solid growth in South Africa's agriculture. And you fast forward, you go into the start of this year, we had these heavy rainfalls across the country, which to an extent, affected some of the crops in Central South Africa. And if you were to look at the numbers about what people expect to harvest, you would see that they are somewhat lower than the past two years, which were excellent. Now, on the backdrop of that, we were already expecting some bit of a contraction in agricultural performance this year. Our estimates at ACBIS uh, is anywhere between four and 5% contraction in a cross value added of South Africa's agricultural sector. But that was not going to change the fact that we will remain a net exporter in food and we remain to have some solid supplies um, to assist not only just us, but also the Southern Africa region. And on employment perspective, we're also expecting that employment in agriculture would remain solid uh, regardless of the contraction that we are seeing uh, this year or expecting to see this year. There's a number of important sectors when you think about food, you think about growth of South Africa's agricultural sector. And I would say, uh, looking from 1994 up until to today, the structure of the farming sector in South Africa hasn't changed that much. There's been some changes if you look at the value of the top products that make up, say, 75% of the gross value added in agriculture. But I would say the improvement has only been on the citrus industry. But in composition of all of those um, uh, industries that we see in farming or in our food security haven't changed much. So the back of that contraction that I was mentioning was really the underperformance uh, to an extent around the maize industry, around cattle, um, and to an extent more recently with the KZN situation within the sugarcane industry. That's the flavor before I go on the war issues where we saw these excessive and the destructive in South Africa's farming is exactly on that area that we highlight um, on the map of South Africa on your left hand side of the screen. You look at the light blue all the way parts of Free State, parts of Northwest, uh, southern parts of, uh, of Limpopo, and to an extent within the Eastern Cape and Western Cape also. Those were some of the areas. But all of the uh, decline in crop production that I was speaking about, if you were to look at it over long term, even just taking the past five years, you get a sense that we are not doing badly in our farming. And the chart that is on the right hand side, just focusing on the dark blue line, speaks to that. You look into that and you look around about 2017, you see that we're still expecting fairly good harvests. And I think this is an important perspective then as we transition to see what is happening globally, what is the Ukraine situation doing to global prices and where South Africa stands in that perspective. What we are seeing as an impact of all of these geopolitics on the South Africa first hand, um, as everybody on this call have noted, is really around the pricing um, effect. While we are net exporters of a range of agricultural products, but our pricing uh, to an extent super interlinked with what's going on globally. And these higher prices that since the start of the war uh, is what we have been observing. But I think South Africans will uh, test uh, those that are in this call that food prices have been rising way before the war. And in fact, from around about uh, 2020 um, throughout at this period, we've been seeing an increase in food prices on a range of issues. And I think this is important when we think about the war because prior the, 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 the invasion, we had um, South America experiencing drought. We had China buying a lot of agricultural commodities. We had uh, the likes of Indonesia, Malaysia experiencing some droughts. All of those factors were already supporting prices. And this is what you see on that chart that is on the left-hand side. If you were to look over 2020 to 2021 of that chart, you'll see that all of those lines, either you are looking at cereal oils, dairy, the prices were in the upside trajectory. Then as soon as our Russia invasion happens, of course, because of the importance of that region in as far as the composition of exports of the grains and oil seeds, uh, we saw that being propelled. And exactly as you see, 
that FAO food index, food price index um, that shows a, a surge in there. It is now at a record level since 1990, which is an inception of that index, which basically showed the anxiety that is there. This doesn't mean that, of course, all of the supplies that Ukraine have and Russia have is locked in there. A large part of the products that they export to the world market had already left their shores. But I think there's worries more about the upcoming uh, seasons. Everybody on the course probably knows that roughly 30% of the grain um, uh, export of the wheat exports um, globally is from the Black Sea region. Uh, roughly 60% of, of, of uh, sunflower oil, 30% of barley. So these are important uh, countries when it comes to trade um, onto that. But the other resultant effect that we have seen is the fact that some of the other grain exporting countries, as well as vegetable oil exporting countries like Indonesia, seeing the rise on prices as a result of the war, they've also reacted by banning the exports of some of the products. Uh, the case in point is the palm oil exports, which have been banned. And all of that uh, is an added factor to these price increases that we are already seeing. And South Africans are seeing that in a number of the vegetable oils uh, that we typically buy. But looking at all of these global dynamics and uh, then to say, what do they mean for food prices in South Africa? In South Africa, food prices have been rising, but I would say at a moderate pace than what we are seeing globally. To an extent that even this year, while I'm talking about record levels um, of, of agricultural commodity prices, but if you look at the retail, uh, retail prices, we expect South African prices to rise at least with a slightly moderate pace than what we saw last year. We have, for example, South Africa's consumer food price index at ACT is at 6% compared to about 6.5% last year. The reason we put that point is that when you look at the food basket, in general, it looks like most of the things are rising, but in essence, it's largely vegetable oils and grains. Fruit and, ve fruit and uh, vegetables, uh, we expect those to soften in South Africa and to an extent even meat. And I would say that is going to counter when you're looking overall the entire food basket, the increases that are in grains, as well as oils and fats or vegetable oils. So which is why you see us having a somewhat uh, muted number onto that. In as far as supplies, we don't expect any shortages of the supplies in South Africa. We have talked with all of the businesses that are involved um, in the trade of a number of products. We import in large part as a country about five uh, our food products, which is palm oil, uh, wheat, um, uh, meat, rice, and all of those, uh, and to an extent, of course, whiskies. Um, if you were add all of those to say uh, the pipeline of the products that we have online that will be will be brought into our shores, we expect that we'll be able to get some good volumes of all of those, and uh, we are comfortable in that extent, with the exception, of course, of the price. And very quickly. Um, as I to head towards closing, the other issue that is important, of course, is to say we hear that there is availability for now going into probably mid-2023. But what happens next? Will the farmers be able to plant all of that is needed so that we have food from 2023 going into 2024? On that, I would say there is a bit of a risk that comes on the fertilizer. As everybody knows, Russia is a leading uh, fertilizer exporter. About 14% of global fertilizer products uh, exports comes from there, but also send some other products that are mixed in fertilizers in China, Canada, that they get from the Russian side. And fertilizer prices by the last year were already plus 50% up. So this year we've seen prices further increasing and the chart on the right hand side tries to get that point across. So the core question then that we are sitting with now is to say the increases in the fertilizer prices, will they be enough to cover the, the to, 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 to cover the, 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 the to do, will they be enough to make sure that farmers remain profitable and they increase their planting? And this is where there is some bit of a doubt. But in our sense, in all of the surveys that we have done, we're still getting a sense that the South African farmers will continue to plant uh, solidly. Of course, some might reduce the fertilizer usage, and that has implications on the yields. But I think we will get a much more good feel of that around about October, November. But in as far as the affordability, as the availability of fertilizers, 
we still get comfort with all of the fertilizer companies that we've spoken with uh, since the invasion of the war, that they have sufficient supplies, not only for us, but also for much of the BNLS countries within our region to be able to plant. But this will come at a much higher cost um, than uh, the conditions have been in the past few years. Let me take the last minute to make a word or so about the KZN issue as to whether they are introducing added risk to us. And I would say the KZN story, as well as the devastation that we have seen on that side, um, it has had costs on agriculture, the sugar industry, poultry sector, piggery sector, but it still doesn't change the fact that we will have enough food supplies as the country. And we think that looking collectively in all of the damage that has been done there, we don't think that it really threatens um, the standing of the South African agricultural sector uh, to a large extent. But of course, the, I would never underplay the damage that has happened to those industries, particularly the sugarcane industry. So the rebuilding process that the colleagues will be doing um, side, it will rather be uh, very costly, particularly when they think about the replanting um, in the sugar sector. So the key thing is that then on our side, uh, as, I, as I close off colleagues, the war in the Ukraine, the risks that have been added, we are feeling them more um, on the pricing effect rather than the availability of supplies. And we expect that to be the reality, at least um, uh, throughout this year and going on into the better the period thereafter, it will really be determined by where their farming inputs are at the end of the year, in as far as the pricing side, even there, not um, on the availability. So that's the story on a really uh, brief comment, uh, Prof. And uh, let me pass on now the, the ball back to the table, but thank you so very much. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, I, I was just saying that was truly exceptional. I, I, I wish you could go on for a while. Um, but uh, if you could keep uh, some of your 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 gunpowder derived for the Q and A, but uh, thank you for a very very astute analysis. Uh, our next speaker then is uh, Professor Viegi. Nicola, over to you. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you for inviting me, and th thank you, Vandile, uh, for this uh, introduction because it's. Uh, it's very important uh, when we think about this kind of shock. It's really analyze in details the effect in all different markets. And uh, there is no question that the cultural markets, and I think it, it was was interesting to give this, this relevance to the, to, agricultural, to the agricultural sector in this discussion, because for South Africa has got a huge distributional effect. And these, these shocks have got a huge distributional effect uh, and uh, this one uh, was in a situation that is uh, already, from the socioeconomic point of view, very difficult. Let me let me talk a bit about uh, uh, sort of the general context in which the, the shocks arrive, and uh, uh, what are the other effects that we are going to see, and uh, how can we uh, how can we prepare, or what what can we do to mitigate some of the effects. When we have big shocks like this, we need to think about how big the shock is. Therefore, uh, compared to shock in the past, for people that uh, of my age, we remember similar shock in the past. Uh, how big it is compared to those, and uh, how long uh, we expect the shock to last. Therefore, you know, if the shocks are short and sharp, uh, then we go back to some normality. Uh, if the shock is long. Uh, we will have to think about much stronger and uh, longer structural policies that allow the system to adapt to not a shock, but a new situation, a new equilibrium, a new global uh, condition. The shock is comparable to the shock, we, uh, oil shock that we have experienced in the 70s, uh, 80s during the Iranian uh, revolution. Therefore, it's very significant from a global point of view. We know that uh, there is a very strong correlation between uh, the what happened in the oil market, especially this kind of shock, and what is the expected world growth in the future. And we know that the correlation is negative. When the price goes up, we know that the, the global economy is slow down. Slow down in a situation that already there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, if you want on the other direction, therefore, after the pandemic, with the global economy was coming out of the pandemic, but with a lot of disruption in the supply chain, in the global 
in the global organization of markets that produce a lot of price and inflationary effect and a lot of economic disruption in, uh, in, a, lot, in, in a lot of de 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 developed countries with very big inflationary effect that was and is uh, pushing uh, the central banks uh, in the uh, developed countries, actually you know, all over the world, uh, to increase the interest rate to try to control this inflationary effect. And this Ukrainian shock will just reinforce this process of inflationary effect, plus the contraction in the, in the global economy. Then we go back to a situation in the global economy that very similar stagflation, uh, a, a stagflation balance in which there is an inflationary pressure that central banks will try to uh, control with an increasing interest rate a uh, contractionary uh, pressure given by the increase in the cost of commodities, my, uh, raw material and oil and uh, uh, petrol that will contract, contract the economy. And this double whammy coming to South Africa is, uh, is particularly dangerous because not only we don't have we don't expect an increase in global demand to just sustain the growth of the South African economy, but the increase in interest rate of the rest of the world will not even uh, will reduce the ability of the South African economy to attract foreign capital to try to finance uh, to finance the external the external debt uh, the, the external debt of the economy. Therefore, in some sense, we are. We are, we are unlucky in the sense that we will not be able uh, to use the growth of the global economy as a way for us to get out of the, the current crisis that has lasted for, for a very long time. And at the same time, the increase in interest rate in the rest of the world will force partly also monetary policy here to respond to this. There is a sort of alignment and we reduce the ability of the South African economy in re, or relying on, uh, on international capital to somehow move through the imbalances and try to, 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 smooth, uh, to smooth the crisis. All these uh, hit the economy, hit the country at the end of 10 years, more than 10 years, uh, or essentially economic stagnation, where, uh, you know, uh, we are now an employment rate of 35% after the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, there was no growth. The unemployment was high. Uh, there was a series uh, and of, of external and internal shock that essentially uh, destroyed a lot of the buffer stock, the protective uh, uh, layer of uh, saving institution or of, of uh, policies. Uh, and now we are a bit uh, unprepared to respond to, to this. As I said, unemployment 35%, and we cannot expect the global economy to, to bring us out. Inflationary pressure, the foreign monetary policy will at least maintain a neutral stance. Uh, but we have an infrastructure crisis that is long lasting, a crisis in education system, a crisis, uh, very little policy space from the fiscal policy side, but fiscal policy has been effective at least from 2013. There is research we are doing uh, with Tumisang, uh, Tumisang and people at the SAR, but we are analyzing the effect of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy in South Africa is, is not productive from at least 2012, 2013. And we have used that instrument to the, uh, to the hill. Therefore, I mean, the situation is, is worrying. Uh, and, and the shocking case again is another shock Actually, it's a double shock of case then. First, the, the, the riots, and now the case then is a very important part of the country, has got a uh, very systemic effect. Therefore, what we do? I think that, uh, first of all, we need really to accept the fact that this kind of global shock we are not transitory, but will be a sort of a permanent future. 
because now we have this, but we, uh, as as one dealer was uh, was alluding, we have still all the climate change uh, or the, the the climate change problem and how these these continuous uh, weather shocks that affecting uh, affecting our country will be a sort of a persistent characteristic. And the global economy will not, after the pandemic and after this war, will never be uh, the locomotive of our own growth like it was in the early 2000s, because it's going to be fragmented. When there is war, there is fragmentation in the global economy, there is fragmentation of uh, uh, supply chain, uh, there is a strategic thinking about the economy therefore is a sort of everybody's bringing the economy uh, back internally more protective in order to have a, a geopolitical instrument and this is what is clearly happening in europe that you cannot depend on the global economy both for the pandemic and now the war you cannot depend on the global economy and you will bring back in a sort of protective instrument uh, and uh, self-reliance. But this one is not good for a small open economy like South Africa that they instead will benefit uh, or is very much uh, a country that is very much connected to uh, the global economy. Therefore, this situation will be permanent. And therefore, we need both from the, money, from, from the point of view of the policy, monetary policy and uh, fiscal policy, but in general, from the point of view of our society, really, we really need, with, uh, as I say, with urgency, really start to think about the robustness of the economy, the strength of the economy, build, build back buffer stock, deal with the, you know, the, the, the fundamental, problems of this economy and this society uh, uh, in a sort of urgent way. I, 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 I do a few examples just to, uh, and then we can, uh, for example, on the issue uh, uh, on the issue of uh, uh, when we think about a strong economy, we really have to take serious few things. One, we should, I think, really rely much more on the capacity of sort of the private sector or the economy to find way out of crisis. This reliance, this excessive reliance of the thinking of the state as a way to plan a uh, way out of, of this crisis, I think it's just, we need to have much more experimentation. We need to open the space for the private sector. That it means also doing the reforms that are necessary for the private sector to be able to find the space. Uh, it then means reforming the markets, uh, uh, opening it up uh, to new entrepreneurship, uh, really financing new entrepreneurship. Uh, we keep on having all these instruments uh, to finance new entrepreneurship. We, we spend a lot of money to support the new entrepreneurship, but actually we want to control what the, you know, what this new entrepreneurship should be. It actually, it's not, a, it's not easy. The new we have a new instrument for financing new entrepreneurship in which the interest rate will be uh, 10% more than uh, the, or 11% more than the repo rate. Which, which small business can sustain those, that kind of credit, that kind of rate? Therefore, there is no uh, coherence uh, in the way we think about but even things and uh, like one uh, dealer, uh, one even things like uh, even things like land reform, it's time to decide. It's time to eliminate the uncertainty, to make decision, or go in the details, and think very hardly how a land reform can increase the productivity of land. 
and increase the wealth base of the poor population of this country. We can use the land reform as a way to increase the productivity. In the way we should have an education reform that increases the productivity of the fiscal expenditure. That we need, uh, we, we need really to think productivity, to use the resources we have in the best possible way. Uh, and we need to eliminate the position of rent of everybody that actually stop this economy to find a way out of this situation. Therefore, the solution of this problem will not be outside of us. Well, the global economy will not give us much room anymore. This uh, international crisis reduce the space of South Africa. We need to find our own productivity, internal productivity, making the decisions that are necessary to be made with this idea that the importance is the increase of the productivity, the increase of the capacity of this economy to, uh, to grow, to generate innovation, to generate new, uh, new ways, and also new ways in relation to, to the relation with the rest of Africa. We are not gonna grow by trying to sell BMW to the US. Let's, let's be clear about this. We are just paying BMW to employ a few people here. Uh, by the way, this is not the base of the growth of the economy. The base of the, the only way out for this is the rest of the continent. Is South Africa assuming a role in support and in in co-participation with the rest of the continent, given also the fact that the rest of the world will not be for a while a reliable partner. We have seen it during the pandemic and we will see it now during the war. Therefore, there is almost, you know, I repeat a lot of this, uh, this thing because it's sort of this, this dramatic of the situation. It's just compounding, this shock are arriving a compounding, we are waiting and we are discussing, we are making plans, we are, eh? but the fundamental are very clear what we need to do. You know, what's happening to the education system is very clear what we need to do. You know, yeah, Professor Janssen, you, 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 you know, I read you to, to, to say this, <laughs> but it's very clear what we need to do. But we need to make a decision because otherwise the, the uh, the alternative is that given the general condition is just that this decline and this, this conflict that is clearly developing around the country will become you know, endemic and then uh, therefore on this, but I, I think actually, you know, my, South Africa can be the California of Africa in some sense. We could be the place where the best mind, African mind, the best, uh, innovation, etc., is generated because we have the best universities on the continent, because we have the best institution in the continent, the best constitution, we, the protection of rights, that means also the protection of, of, of creative minds that can be here. You know, we have a lot of potential and possibility, but we need to make the decisions that are important because the external context is not going to give us any more time to achieve. Uh, to achieve that. Maybe I, I'll stop here. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Professor Viegi. That was, that was th thank you for a comprehensive response, but also for reflecting on ways out of the dilemma, because for, for us, those of us who are not economists, it's very difficult to sort of see your way out of this uh, global crisis uh, as it is. Thank you, sir. Uh, and now over to Professor Bauman. Heinrich, uh, your turn. Uh, good morning, team, and, and thank you to my colleagues for already quite comprehensive response to the issue on the table. The, you know, the whole nexus of, of the war in the Ukraine, oil prices rising, just general price pressures. And, and I think on top of that, just all the many other worries we have in this country already, right? So um, what I'm going to try and focus my comments on before we open it up for Q&A is just um, you know, to, to give the audience a bit of a, uh, perhaps a, a better understanding of uh, how directly changes in the oil price will affect 
um, prices at the pump in terms of fuel and, and other prices in, in the economy. I'll talk a little bit about that. That's what some of my recent research has focused on. And, um, and then another topic uh, I want to talk about is just in general, um, how we could perhaps better use all these fancy economic models we use in academia and out there as practitioners um, uh, and, and encourage governments and, and industry stakeholders to use these tools to better prepare for uh, disasters and big shocks of this nature. Um, I, I think, you know, a problem we've, we've kind of, that's become endemic is um, our, our policymakers are quite reactionary when it comes to, to big shocks, right? Um, and, and it doesn't seem like we have a playbook ready to go for when big shocks, unanticipated events happen. Um, it seems like we're always scrambling from one crisis to the other um, without having you know, an upfront idea of, of who's going to uh, um, be impacted the most and how can we mitigate, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll talk a little bit about um, how the, the, the tools we have at our, at our disposal can, can help with that. So just in terms of, of, of um, just focusing quickly on, on the petrol price, which of course, as we know, filters through into so many other prices uh, we see out there. Um, it's important to remember that, that the, the, the pump price um, that we, we pay for fuel consists basically of three main components. We call it the basic fuel price. Um, and, and that's basically the equivalent if we had to just import uh, refined petroleum from wherever it, it, it gets made and gets to our shores, that's that basic cost, right? Uh, but then on top of that, South Africa has quite substantial taxes, right? We have two main taxes, the general fuel levy, and the road accident fund. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that because that's actually been a source of, of relief for us, believe it or not, um, in terms of what we are currently paying for prices. And then finally, we have what we call these, these margins or the regulatory accounting framework. Um, and, and that's basically all the costs related to getting the fuel from A to B uh, and allowing the fuel stations to then operate in a sustainable way, all right? So, um, in short, then, what it means is this big oil price shock is, is basically only affecting this basic fuel price component, right? Which, as I said, it, it's driven by the oil price and the rand dollar. Now, um, luckily for us, the rand dollar has remained fairly stable. Uh, we've had quite a, a bit of a depreciation, though, in the last two weeks or so. So you'll probably feel some of that in, in the next uh, fuel price. Um, but compared to where we were right after COVID struck initially, um, you know, if we look at a, a bit more longer term average, the RAND dollar is, is, is actually been doing all right. Um, and the main source of the fuel price increases has been this world price increase. So, you know, and it's quite a volatile thing, right? I'm sure some of us remember about two years ago this time, uh, world prices dipped to extreme lows. Uh, world price futures were basically gone down to zero. Um, uh, the, the basic fuel price component in uh, what was it, May 2020 at its lowest. No one probably noticed because no one was allowed to drive around, right? Uh, a bit unfortunate. But um, the, the, the oil price and, uh, and how it's impacted the basic fuel price meant that that basic fuel price component dropped to only about 22% of the pump price, with the rest of the price being all these taxes and, and margins, right? Like I say, we, we probably didn't notice because no one was driving around and putting fuel in their cars. Um, but, but for a three month period there, basic fuel prices dropped an enormous, uh, you know, almost historic lows, at least for recent history. Um, but, th but that didn't filter quite through in terms of the same change in, in pump prices. And now we're seeing the reverse. Uh, just since January, um, oil prices have jumped, um, well, significantly, right? We've gone from about uh, 70 odd dollars a barrel to over 110 at times now recently. Um, the basic fuel price in, a, in, in you know, driven by that has jumped about 40% uh, since January. But the pump price has only gone up 11%, right? You know, that still equates to, to nearly two rand. Um, but it could have been significantly worse because what, what has happened is as part of the relief to consumers is um, the, at least temporarily, the general fuel levy was cut by one rand 50, which has mitigated 
a significant amount of the increase we would have been felt had the normal formula been, been followed. Um, that though is, is was only temporary relief and it's due to expire at the end of this month. So, um, you know, we, if in the status quo, we're in for a, a, a rough ride with the petrol price next month, if the, if the fuel levy returns to its normal level, uh, and with the rand dollar having depreciated quite a bit, oil price is still above $100. Um, a significant fuel price hike is, is on the cards again for next month, right? So, so that doesn't bode well for inflation in general and, and just uh, affordability in a country that, of course, is already struggling uh, economically. But, you know, given that we have such a big tax component, it has afforded us an opportunity for temporary rel relief, at, at least, you know, Quite simply, without that, uh, the, the pump price would have been one rand fifty more today, as we speak. Right, so we'll, we'll see, given how the, the other variables respond over the next month or so, whether that temporary measure uh, is extended or not. But we have to remember, you don't get something for nothing, right? Um, the 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 general fuel levy makes up a, a considerable component of tax revenue for the country. Uh, you know, between 70 and 80 billion rand of tax revenue in the country is, is purely from the general fuel levy. So by, by cutting that for, for a, a considerable period of time, as many might hope we do, um, means that there's going to be an under collection of revenue in that regard. And of course, government is already spending more than it, it earns through tax revenue. And, and so better understanding all those general equilibrium uh, impact of all our policy decisions is very important for our planning. You know, we don't want to come to the end of the fiscal year and go, whoops, you know, there's a uh, 100 billion rand hole. Um, you know, because as they say, a billion year and a billion there, and pretty soon we're starting to talk about real money. Um, so, you know, we, we have to uh, better understand using our tools how our policy decisions today is going to affect the economy down the line and so that we can have plans in place and not be reactionary. Um, from a fiscal point of view, we, you know, elements of the, the, the recent crisis have, have indirectly helped us a bit because commodity prices, uh, of which South Africa exports significantly, has been higher than usual. And we've, we've made a lot of additional tax revenue on that front. And so that's more, most likely where this temporary rel relief gets funded from, right? It is from this additional windfall tax revenue. Um, but at the same time, that, that's money that could have, of course, been spent elsewhere. And of course, South Africa has no shortage of places where government can jump in and, and spend more money and, and spend it better, et cetera. Um, so there's always an opportunity cost uh, to these things. Um, but that, that's just for us to, to have a feel for um, how oil prices filter through the system into what we pay at the pump. And of course, then from an industry point of view and commodity specific, it's all about how exposed are you um, to that particular cost element in your basket, right? So usually services uh, are, are not heavily impacted. You're not gonna pay more for your haircut next week just because oil prices are up. Um, but, but, but stuff that relies from, uh, you know, getting long distances from A to B, and then of course, agriculture is heavily exposed to this. Um, you know, even electricity generation, right? Is, um, you know, with all the trucks driving around getting coal from A to B, there, there's a big indirect the transport cost involved in, in electricity generation as well, which will eventually filter through the system. So all these interlinkages are, are very interesting and important to explore uh, for us to have you know, a good feel and anticipation for um, how shocks impact um, uh, different parts of the economy. Um, in terms of uh, just a, a point that was made in terms of um, that, that availability of goods and services are, are still good despite rising prices. Uh, we have to remember that, that prices is a rationing mechanism, right? And, and that it, whilst we still, you know, we, we're not in a crisis, you know, it, it's not like Venezuela. I was, I was last there in 2016 and, and I don't foresee a case where you have to drive to four different shops to find a loaf of bread like, like we had to do back then. But of course it means uh, consumers at, at the end of the income scale are hurt most, right? Because many of them will now have to ration themselves in terms of how much of, of basic food stocks they can afford. Um, 
but but as one daily right, rightly noticed, the, the good thing is that's a much better situation to be in, right? It is to face slightly higher prices, but stuff is still available, then something is just not available regardless of what we were willing to pay for it. So uh, it's certainly the less of two evils. Um, yeah, and, and look, uh, for in, the, in the sake of time, I'll, I'll kind of stop myself here, but I just want to, to reiterate the point that um, I think in general, and, and this goes to many of the, the issues we've seen recently, right? From, from COVID, uh, the KZN floods, um, rising oil prices and inflation in general is, is I encourage our policymakers, our stakeholders, our, our industry leaders um, to, to use the tools at our disposal to, to better um, mitigate for these type of events, right? To, to better understand these events and be ready with a playbook to go in terms of what is the best response, what will be the various impacts from a fiscal side at a national government level to uh, industry level, better understanding where the exposures lie, how supply chain risks can be mitigated against. You know, you must always have a plan B, right? Um, and, and you must always understand the risks that, that you are potentially exposed to, how those will filter through the system and what can be done about it. Instead of, you know, waiting for the next crisis to hit and then only trying to figure out, all right, what do we do now? So I, I will leave it there, thanks. Thank you very much, Heinrich. Uh, fascinating as well. I think the point that you raise that for me is, in fact, <laughs> when I was at the University of Pretoria, I used to have these, these conversations with, with some of your colleagues. Why are we so bad at anticipating the future? Why are we so bad at planning the future? You know, so you say, of course, plan B, you absolutely can. I mean, anybody could have seen this ESCOM crisis. In fact, they did see it years ago. But we don't, we in the year and now in our politics, and I'd like to, maybe some of our <clears throat> audience might also just want to tease that out with you. Um, why is it that we don't see beyond our, our, our immediate uh, crisis? Um, <clears throat> some great questions in the, in the, uh, in, in the chat. Uh, Wandile, do you want to perhaps start off by responding to the questions directed to you? Uh, and if for the sake of those who might not have seen it, just to summarize the question and then give a brief response, uh, 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 over to you. Uh, th thanks, and uh, also thanks to Prof. Borman and Prof. Uh, Viergi for, for, for the inputs. Let me, let me try to start with these questions. The first one we have is from uh, uh, Mr. Tabo Chauke, and he's asking if, is it not feasible to imagine that uh, the effects of the war will not only come uh, through the for long, but over time, South African farmers will find interest in selling some of the produce that we have elsewhere in the world and get a better buck for it. And I was smiling as Henry was speaking because he hit the nail where he was saying prices is actually uh, the mechanism which will be able to regulate that. Um, the South African farmers are not getting per se lesser back for their produce by selling to somebody in free state than they would necessarily do when they were selling it uh, to Hong Kong. So to we'll regulate that, the more we are seeing our stocks of various produce uh, reaching or below a certain threshold, because for each commodity, we have in South Africa what we call the balance sheets of commodities, and we know what the minimum operating stocks of each should be, and all of those we update them monthly and we put up publicly. And those tends to send signal, and the minute we are closer to those stocks, you see prices adjusting and the farmers uh, will, will find more incentive to sell domestically. So we don't see that as a risk, uh, but of course, under extraordinary circumstances, uh, in the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1997-98, uh, the Minister of Agriculture in South Africa does have powers uh, to see how they would regulate uh, the issues around the agricultural exports commodities. But of course, that, that would be something that we don't think it would be necessary at this point. But just to point out that there are tools to deal um, with, with, with extraordinary circumstances, but we are not there um, at, at this point. And I think then uh, there is a saying for all of those of us who are in rural areas, which says uh, higher prices, uh, a, 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 the cure for higher prices is higher prices, because as those prices remain high, 
uh, it does incentivize in turn also the production. So which is why you find us um, a bit more comfortable on that point. The last question um, that is from Mr. Dieto uh, Manoko, it says, is there a time where South Africa, is, is this not a time where South African government can think of subsidizing farmers um, in production? I mean, I, I work at uh, Dieto in, uh, in an agribusiness and farmer association grouping uh, so that's something that I would like to see happening. But as Professor Viege would say, we don't have a fiscal space um, to actually be taking off money that we would use on rebuilding schools and infrastructure and the roads and really giving on into farmers. So I don't think we, we have space for, for, for that, but it's certainly something desirable. And it's certainly something that we do see in the, develop, in the developed world. And I do think also that South African farmers can be able to thrive uh, to an extent without necessarily having subsidies. Some of the core things that are important is on Professor Vierge's points about the issues of productivity um, and the issues of taking a number of stumbling blocks out of the system. Either it's infrastructure related in, the, in ensuring that our ports are operating efficiently and ensuring that the municipalities are doing their service delivery because all of those begin to lower the costs of doing um, of, of producing food in the rural areas. And in turn, um, of course, it enables people to, to focus on the business which they are supposed to be doing farming and processing food instead of maintaining roads and doing other things that are for public sector. So yeah, that, that I hope that covers you to an extent on that. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Wandile. As, <laughs> as they would say at my Pretor, former university at Pretoria, kort and krachtig, short and sweet. It uh, doesn't quite uh, say the same thing, but thank you for that. Uh, 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 Prof. I, I, I want to tease out something with you. And again, please appreciate that this is coming from a non economy a person without the, the language uh, and, and skills. But as a, as a consumer, I suppose, you know, I, and, and somebody who sort of observes what's happening in the world around oil prices, for example. I mean, is it really possible? Let's start with Europe, right? Is it really possible for Europe to delink <laughs> from Russia? I mean, I'm finding these very complex dance moves. How do we become, how do they become less dependent on Russian oil? Uh, but at the same time, the reason you guys use a term called political economy is because they are political risks to economic decisions. Um, these are interdependent. And I say that in the context of, um, of your very nice example about selling <clears throat> BMWs to the Americans, you know, which of course raises the question, can we delink from these very powerful economies, whether it's oil or BMWs or whatever the case might be, uh, um, and, and perhaps rely mostly or interact mostly with regional African economies and so on. A, a word about that, if you don't mind. Yes, um, on, on my question about there's a lot of the economic decision and the future will be driven, especially in Europe, by this geopolitical question means that sort of the world economy breaks because the idea was that more you uh, interact, the more you are interdependent, the less likely will be a possibility of a conflict. That was the strategic idea of the last, from, from the 90s. Now, if everybody has got a McDonald's, uh, two countries with a McDonald's never fight against each other. The more you are interdependent, and less likely is a conflict. That was driven very much by the German attitude towards the East and why they, they accepted this increased interdependence was because it was also their experience in relation to the, to the USSR, to, to the Soviet bloc, it was engage, become interdependent, and then is the, the, the cost of conflict becomes so high that nobody is going to do this war has shattered this idea. And by even the Trump administration shattered the idea that there is, you know, blocks. Uh, what there is is uncertainty. And answer, you can protect uncertainty by uh, building a fortress. Uh, and what Europe is thinking is to build, building a fortress, to find a substitute, to change the way you produce or you consume to find a new partner. And in this, there can be an opportunity for Africa because you can 
cover a space because now is Europe need a new source of uh, or raw material, you new, new source of oil. Therefore, this a strategic change. Then when I say rely on Africa is is not that in some sense, it's not that we are the link, it's the rest of the world that in breaking down represent less of a certainty of as a path for growth. Therefore, it is not, you know, we should always trade with, with everything and we are with everybody because this one is the nature of, of how also you grow and you, you, you change a structure, you innovate, etc. But you have to rely on the fact that the environment is much more uncertain. And you have to find ways that are much more stable, a policy that are much more robust to these uh, glo global uncertainties. You were asking before about why we cannot predict, you know, uh, why we cannot. Uh, in reality, it's not an issue of you know guessing what the future will be. It's to be prepared for whatever future is going to be. To prepare our, therefore, you know, things like education, infrastructure, uh, institution, okay, all these are buffer stock, are way for an economy to adjust to whatever the future will put uh, in front of us, because these are the uncertainty we are facing. Scientific uh, scientific research uh, base uh, an economy on knowledge on uh, on. Uh, uh, productivity on good infrastructure, good uh, those are not choices. Uh, I become more more existential in a in a place that in a world that is becoming more uncertain. Yeah. This is I think where you know South Africa is stuck. You know the, the decide and then the rest of Africa because in some sense is is the future the future of the world is there. Is the, the youngest guy in the other continent it will be soon the biggest continent? Is the, where the, there will be new entrepreneurship, new ideas? That that is where uh, the future can be. That's my you know. Yeah, <clears throat> Nicola. Before I go to Heinrich <clears throat> and and Heinrich, I, I wonder if you could could respond in a minute to to both Rula and Spear, uh, if you've seen those two questions, <clears throat> Nicola. There was an earlier question from Nioki about. Uh, the impact of the war on SADC, on the regional countries. Do you have a sense of that? Actually, is, is the impact is worse for the rest of the, of the continent because mm. they are more dependent on uh, this one. Uh, Van Dille will, will know much more, actually. They are more dependent on uh, agricultural products uh, from, uh, from Ukraine and Russia. For the disruption, right. these international things are, are much bigger. Uh, I see IMF, etc. Very worried about what this might mean uh, mm. for uh, just basic uh, human uh, welfare, uh, with the welfare uh, in the rest of the continent. The following situation is the impact is expected to much to be bigger in the rest of the continent. Okay, thank you. I'll circle back later to Andila on that as well. Heinrich, over to you. Thanks, Prof. Yeah, so uh, the two questions from uh, Prof. Inglacy, lots, um, in my view, the, the top academic in terms of, of energy, um, field of energy in the country. So, so the, the question is, is, of course, extremely relevant in terms of uh, politics, uh, you know, and, and, um, and then the, the energy transition. Um, and, and energy is, is a field I, I love to talk about as an academic because it, it's become extremely controversial and important at the same time. Uh, so it always makes for, for fascinating discussion if you bring the different role players uh, in. Um, so, you know, th there's no doubt that there has been some inconsistency and, and issues in terms of just policy direction and certainty uh, in the field of energy. And, and that's, it's a critical field to have that problem because it's a field that requires extremely long-term planning, right? You, you need a great deal of certainty in terms of the way forward uh, to create that kind of energy security and we simply haven't had that right um, since the 1998 white paper on energy was was published you know that's pretty much where uh, where the problem starts although you can even go back to the 60s and 70s where we uh, built way too many coal-fired power stations and we you know got involved in, in heavily subsidized uh, pricing arrangements with with um, you know heavy polluters etc and that's where we sort of 
you know, the, the structure of this economy, our dirty economy um, has its genesis. But, but you know, 98, we had, we had the white paper and, and, you know, there was already plans for, um, you know, leaning towards privatization and moving generation out of purely the hands of ESCOM. But it turns out no, no one came um, because ESCOM was actually highly um, price efficient in terms of, of generation even back then. Um, and, and it's taken a long time for the, the other sources of um, electricity generation, you know, the, the renewables, et cetera, to catch up in terms of cost competitiveness relative to coal, which is of course ESCOM staple. Um, and in a country that, that, that always has had high inequality and a high level of poverty, it, it, it made it not really economically feasible to make that jump in large scale, which means we've, we've been dependent on, on coal and, and the diesels for generation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what persistently high prices, of course, do, and as Wandili has already noted, you know, is it, it creates the space and incentives for alternatives to be viable. And, and, and every time we see a big oil price shock or electricity prices based on coal, et cetera, goes up, you know, there's more and more talk about renewables, et cetera. And, and, and we see that, that the case again. Um, but it, it's tricky, right? You know, there's, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of research and a lot of webinars like this on the just transition in the last couple of years, right? And, and it's an extremely um, sensitive uh, um, feel, or, you know, work at the moment. Uh, obviously, already poor regions like Mpumalanga is most heavily affected. And, and, and we know eventually we need to move away from coal. But the question then becomes, how do we do so in, in, a, in a sensible way, in, in a just way, right? And, and again, you know, we've, we've been talking about this for many, many years, but it seems like, again, policy action hasn't kept up with all these, these nice documents and research that gets produced. And it comes back to Rula's first point and, the, you know, the politics and the policy uncertainty. So, you know, we, we need to really do better in that regard. If, if any of this nice research that gets produced in terms of a just transition is actually going to get traction, right? So, um, you know, and, and similar then for, for future energy transitions and then EVs and these things, you know, um, you know we, we really need to, to get our act together and start acting now because we are in competition with the rest of the world here in this regard, right? Um, you know, I'm sitting here in the city of Tuani, one of the global hubs for motor car manufacturing. And, and if we don't start this transition in terms of planning now, in terms of, all right, how are we going to set up uh, both the manufacturing side in terms of producing EVs, but also our own local internal infrastructure for, for charging stations, et cetera. If we don't start that today, we're going to wake up 10 years from now and, and wonder, oh, what happened to this industry? You know, why is it gone? Why has it been replaced by you know, 10 other countries that's just chomping at the bit to, to take our spot, right? Um, so, so we need to, we need to um, uh, you know, get our act together in, in that planning sense, right? Um, and so to, to realize point, you know, would, would these effects have been mitigated had we had a stronger renewable um, component? Um, for sure, right? But, you know, it's, it's a case of, uh, every generation source pretty much has a pro and a con to it, right? The, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine, nuclear is expensive and time consuming to set up, coal is dirty, uh, there's droughts and our water goes away. So, you know, but that's why we need an energy bundle, right? That, that ensures both affordability and energy security. And there's enough research out there to, to, to point us to what are those optimal mixes. Um, I think, you know, personally, I, I like nuclear, except for the fact that disasters happen and it's very expensive, but, but actually um, it, it's, it sometimes gets overblown. And, and, and we've seen nuclear into the, the debate again, uh, mainly on the back of new technologies that allows for smaller, more affordable versions of nuclear to, to be dispersed. But again, that, that's a topic for another day. I'm just stressing that point as part of um, we need all these sources to be part of the discussion, right? If, if we want to build a sustainable and affordable energy mix. Um, right. and, and then just final final question there in terms of can't we just uh, buy the oil directly from Russia? It's a, yeah. you know, in, in theory, it's an interesting point, of course, but we have to understand how, how the market works. Of course, we've had up until recently mostly 
privately run and, and owned refineries, um, taking the crude oil coming from, from uh, various sources, um, refining it, selling it, you know, the price itself has been governed by a formula in which oil prices, uh, you know, averages of different baskets around the world were used. Um, and then, of course, there's various long-term contracts in place. So it, it's very difficult to make a very quick transition in this case. Um, and, and, you know, you must also be careful who you get in bed with, right? Um, um, you know, I think that the BRICS, um, you know, whatever BRICS is, you know, this whole made up group of, of big emerging countries, you know, I think it's a very fragile relationship and quite frankly, uh, a dangerous one, right? Because if we just look at what's going on in those countries, as well as our own, uh, we certainly, um, you know, we, we're not a shining light in the world at the moment in terms of democracies or well-functioning economies, etc. right? So um, whilst uh, refineries could, in theory, switch to to more russian oil it's not a it's not a government decision that can be made because the, the refineries they're not government owned or run even though government have some shares in some of those and of course there's talk of of some of these refineries which have been shutting down recently being taken over by government in which case such decisions could be made i suppose uh, faster in, in theory but but for right now that's not a, a possibility for us to just say oh, why don't we buy russian oil um, it, it's up to the individual refineries um, uh, to do that. Plus, you know, most of our the petrol we consume is actually just direct imports of the re refined version as well. So it's not the crude oil anymore, mainly because our refinery capacity has been diminished so much in recent years. Um, so it's um, it's more where it gets refined from. Uh, but anyway, all interesting points. Uh, let's let's move. yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, I, I, um, I'm going to give you a last question. Um, I, I, you know, in preparing <laughs> for, for uh, one of the books I just finished on political economy of higher education, I came across a lovely quote by someone which I've used as an epigraph uh, to one of the chapters. It says, the personal is political economy. And I like that. So I want to take this down from the big questions that you guys deal with in your own thinking uh, and ask uh, this, what you're seeing for the ordinary citizen in our country? Uh, and Luigi, uh, Nicola spoke about this to some extent, is the compounding effects of the Ukrainian crisis on people who are really already circling, already struggling. You know, you're struggling with electricity outages. I woke up this morning and the electricity is out again. You know, unemployment, obviously, um, low to no growth uh, and poor quality education for most of our children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this comes on top of, you know, uh, my, my colleague, uh, Professor Pumla Gaborda Marikizala talks about the compounding effects of trauma on people. Uh, so this is not in isolation of, uh, uh, you know, all the other things going on. What can we do as individual citizens to, to some extent, you know, you, you sort of feel that you're a victim of state, everything from state capture to state incompetence to, state, you know, you feel, and especially people who are in the poorest, the poorest among us, what do you do? Uh, do we buy Teslas? Do we? switch off the lights do we you know what 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 can individual make the political economy personal for a moment uh and i'm going to ask each of you to give some practical wisdom to 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 ordinary people uh, um uh sorry Wendell, i'll start with you again if you don't mind and then end up with uh, heinrich yeah th this is a difficult question uh prof what can an individual do I think the, I think our problems. I mean, they come from all sorts of angles. Uh, Professor Vierge spoke to that. Uh, uh, Professor Bowman spoke to that. You just alluded to some, but I think at the core, I mean, we spend a lot of time, uh, and, and we'll, we'll know this from economic roundtables that you, the central bank and the others speaking with people at the high level, uh, and Pretoria can understand what the problems are. But and and you can even go as far and say even in politics. 
um, issues can be understood to an extent at Lutuli House by and the others, but improvements happen at a local and a municipality level. Yeah. So people, what they can do is intervening at that level and saying, how do they select and work with their representatives on improving that? Let me just make a quick example, which was such a, a great thing for, for me to explain. The past few days, I spent Saturday with farmers in the state um, in, in, in areas around Aidenville and the others. The next day, I flew down and the roads were terrible driving there and seeing what's happening in the towns and the despair in all of the small free state towns. Then the next day, I had another former engagement um, down in French Hook, just outside there. When you see how the roads and uh, the vibrancy in the farming sector onto that, the key question then is to say, how do you learn the governance and the maintenance of basic infrastructure, in my view, from one city to the next, which then as an individual, you have to agitate your people um, that you have elected to try and spend the money wisely on that. And I think once we have been able to do that, then the small business um, investments that would come perhaps would land on a better field. So I would say use political economy to get things right. I wouldn't say accept your reality um, and carry your cross and try to make a living out of it. No, we, we, we have to uh, deal with the, with the right political economy and the choices that people in office are currently making, which I think for many towns are not serving the, uh, the people of South Africa well. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Wandile. Nicola? See, I, I follow Wandile. He's organized. Organized. Because we, we cannot accept. There must be some, some. The only way you change is to change the political economy, change the incentive of the people that is in position of leadership that can make decisions. Sometimes I ask myself, I ask, I ask you, you know, sometimes, for example, when we talk about the school, the education problem, there is also a fundamental agency, for example, the parents. Why, why the power of the parents don't have the power because it's the future of their kids. Therefore, there is a sort of, you know, organized to ask for a better education at the local level in that place, because it's the future of the kids, and then it's the future of the country, but that is a sort of byproduct of the future. Therefore, it's the family organized, the individual. I say the students as well in universities. Some sense that the free must fall. It's important that the student should, should demand more from each of us yeah? because we you know, we need we need more we need better and the demand must come from below because we cannot expect a, a new plan the new plan is not gonna there is no uh, magic five-year plan anywhere that solve the situation but the organization uh, yeah, you are from the generation of organize. Organize is the, is, is the only way to change the political economy and then to see possibility that now we, we, we can see. Mm, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. And Heinrich? Yeah, look, you know, the, this, this question itself is a, is a function of the, the kind of despair we face in our key institutions and our economy mm. in general. It, it's a question rich countries would, would frown at you and go, but what do you mean? You know, because it, it, if, if things go wrong for a, a period of time, if there's, if there's a negative shock, the, the various institutions and governments just need to play their role to help mitigate against that. And you, you make it through that, that bad cycle and, and life returns to normal. But in South Africa, we, we've We've faced so many crises upon crisis, and, and you know we've made it sort of through the decade of state capture that, that our institutions are so run down that, that it is now down to the individual. And what can an individual do in, in the face of, of so much um, you know heartache and, and poverty? You know, not much. It's trying to survive in the very short run. Use communities as best you can to, to make it through this. Uh, but then we have to, as we've already mentioned, the political economy. Democracy is an, inst uh, an incentive mechanism, right? If, if your leaders, whether it's at a local or a national level, are, are not doing what we know they should, uh, you know, we, we should in a very unemotional way uh, replace them with someone we think we can do a better job, right? Um, of course, South Africa is still a young democracy and there's a lot of emotions attached to elections, right? But, but that's, that's the only way we, 
we start making progress in terms of better service deliveries, it's holding our leaders to account. Um, and I had a radio interview the other day to say, you know, similar question. What, you know, is there any good news? And I thought, well, the only good news I kind of see coming from this, you know, on the back of the KZN floods is, is people are starting to realize a lot of the problems we face could have been avoided through better leadership, uh, a stronger political economy, better institutions. And I think people are now starting to wake up to the idea that, hey, you know, we're going to hold these guys accountable um, if, they, if they don't do a good job for us, because that's ultimately why they are there is to serve us, not for us to somehow make their lives easier, right? Um, so, yeah, look, I mean, in, in the very short run, it, it's basically good luck to us all, right? It's, it's a very tough spot we are in, and especially at the lower end of the income levels. If I can just quickly elaborate on Wandile's on, uh, earlier point, this, it's an exercise I always start my economic modeling class with using our CG models. I say, who is most exposed to a drought, right? And we use our models to show all right, yes, uh, you know, there's the farmers and this, but it, it takes all these interlinkages into account and it ends up being uh, the, the, the poorest, uh, the, the, the lowest income groups spend the biggest share of their income on food, right? Even though the rich guys, we all spend much more on food overall, but it makes up a relatively small share of our income, right? Whereas the poor, mm -hmm. whilst they might consume less, it makes up a much bigger share of their their consumption bundle, which means they are most exposed to these kind of shocks, which means we need to, to help protect uh, farmers during the drought so that, that the price pressures don't spike too much so that we can protect the poor. Um, and, and so again, we, we need to understand these mechanisms, these interlinkages to protect those who are most vulnerable. Uh, but in the long run, that is best done through ensuring strong institutions. One delay. Nicola and Heinrich, this was an intellectual feast. Um, I enjoyed it thoroughly, and I'm sure uh, our uh, sizable seminar crowd did as well. Thank you so much for your expertise. Thank you for your contribution to the Academy of Science of South Africa, and uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you to Boho for all the arrangements. Um, I never ever sign off on anything unless our CEO Himla Sudio, the famous geneticist, says something as well. Himla, did you want to uh, just conclude for us? Thank you, Professor Hansen, and uh, thank you to all the speakers who have given us uh, an opportunity of a view into their world of uh, economics and help us understand how the landscape of economics and politics um, uh, presents to us where we are having to deal with the crisis in Ukraine and Russia and it's a spillover and cascade effects to the rest of the world. It's been really, really enlightening. And I really appreciate the fact that uh, as a, a resource in the country, we still have opportunities to grow and adapt to the crises that are we being presented with. And I think we are very privileged to have the likes of the astute colleagues who have been on our panel today to mm -hmm. not just help us as ordinary individuals, but also the government in um, you know, lending your views in a constructive way, whether it be asked or not, but just to present to them some alternates that they may be aware of and that can look that they can look at in terms of developing our pathway forward. So thank you very, very much. And thank you also to you, Jonathan, for uh, bringing us the special edition of the Science for Business series. As you've mentioned, this, uh, this opportunity for us to engage with people who think in the business mind helps us as an academy to extend our net, uh, to bring in other aspects of, uh, of who we are uh, into the midst of how we conduct ourselves as an academy, but also at the same time to help us uh, learn from your expertise, not just to position the academy, but uh, in ways in which the academy can contribute to, towards what we call our evidence-based uh, research in the service of society. So thank you all so much. And uh, we look forward to, to watching
your profiles in the media and social media, etc. as we go forward. And I'm sure that as I can see from the comments coming from the audience, that we have all really, really appreciated your input, your frankness and clarity with which you've um, shared your knowledge with us today. Thank you all so much.